Um, I warned people that I might start a little early, and so I'm going to hold true to my word, because I've got a lot of things I want to say. So I'll get th through some of the basics already. <coughs> um, <coughs> so this is sort of the third piece of presentation I'm doing here at the conference, and there's a whole bunch of sort of container and isolation type topics. I did C groups yesterday. There were at least a few people I saw yesterday who were here today, so that's good. Um, <coughs> and I'm doing set comp now, and on Wednesday I'm going to talk about user namespaces. So if you want to find out about all the bits and pieces that are used to build sandboxes and containers, I'm going to cover most of them. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, set comp. So, uh, oh, just a little bit about myself. I'm the maintainer of the Linux Man Pages project. Um, I wrote a book. I do training courses, okay, on stuff like this, just in case. Um, so, set comp. What's the fundamental idea that's going on here? The kernel provides, I don't know, 400 or so different system calls. The way most of us think about system calls is they're a way of asking the kernel to get something done. The way an attacker thinks of those system calls is this is four to 400 different ways I can try and subvert the system. Now, there are 400 different system calls, but most programs only make a small subset of those system calls. It'd be quite typical that um, many common programs in their lifetime would only make say, at the most, 40 different system calls. And the idea here is then, suppose we have a program, we expect to make it, a, to, it to make a certain set of system calls, but for some reason, it makes one of the other system calls. Now, the possible reason there is the program has been subverted and tricked into executing malicious code. And so, if it tries to execute a system call that we don't expect, we want to stop it doing that because something is wrong. And that's what set comp is about. Making sure that if a program tries to do things that we don't expect in terms of system calls, it's prevented from doing so. <coughs> okay. So what we're doing then effectively is reducing the attack surface of the kernel. Now, if a program gets subverted, you know, we expected the program to, let's say, make 40 different system calls, but it, now with setcomp, it can only make those 40 different system calls, which limits the possibilities for the attacker to try and subvert the system. Alrighty, so, um, SecComp has actually been around for a long time. It was um, first implemented back in 2005, but in a much more limited form. The way you set up SecComp back then for a particular process, you wrote one to a, a, a certain proc PID file, and when, when you did that, the process was then in strict SecComp mode. And in strict, strict SecComp mode, the process was only allowed to make four system calls. Read and write to ION files, um, Exit to terminate and sig return. Now, sig return is an, a system call you'd never normally make directly from an application. It's used under the covers to implement signal handlers. So, with the strict mode, the only thing you do is read and write files that are already open or terminate or catch signals. If the program tries to make any other system calls, if the process tries to make any other system calls, then it gets killed with a signal, sig kill, and it's, it's, it's dead straight away, of course. The original idea here, when um, this strict set comp mode was implemented, um, was to create a marketplace in CPU cycles. The kernel developer concerned, um, Andrea Arcangeli, had this idea that you, know, you could sell your CPU time to someone else, they would provide you with um, perhaps some byte code or perhaps some native code that did some compute bound task and you could run it on your system safe in the knowledge that the only things it could do in terms of interacting with your um, kernel were reading on writing on file descriptors that you'd given to that program because one of the system, one of the system calls that isn't allowed there is open to open a new file. So you can only read and write files that have already been opened for you 
or terminate or catch signals. So for a long time, this, 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 um, this um, CPU marketplace idea never really took off. And so for a long time, um, set comps sat around, sat around not being much used. But things changed um, seven years later in 2012, Linux 3.5, when set comp filtering was added. And this was such a big change to how set comp worked that sometimes this is called set comp 2. And the key point here now is you can load a filter program into the kernel and you can choose which system calls are going to be allowed and disallowed. So you no longer have just the strict mode where there's only a certain four set of system calls allowed. You can say, well, actually, this is the set of system calls I'm going to allow, and everything else is disallowed. Or perhaps you can just say, I want to disallow certain system calls and allow everything else. OK, the way you did this was you used um, PRCTL, which is one of these sort of horrible multiplexing system calls that does dozens of different things to a process. And one of the things you can do is set a sec comp filter for the process. So now you can choose which system calls are going to be allowed and disallowed. Now, people wanted this sort of feature for a very long time before sec comp 2 was invented. People have been wanting this ability to filter system calls in some way for, for many years. And there'd been various mechanisms proposed over the years, but they all were rejected by kernel developers because they were um, perhaps overcomplicated or difficult to maintain or somehow unsuitable for being merged into the mainline kernel. And when this feature did finally get used, uh, finally get merged, then people started using it pretty quickly. And by now, it's being used in a lot of tools. And this is just a few examples. So for example, the web browsers are using it, the container frameworks are using it, tools like Firepack and um, uh, FireJail, Flatpak and FireJail are using it, um, SystemD is using it, SystemD uses everything, um, <coughs> which is a good thing. OK. The work on SecComp is still ongoing. There's um, even new stuff getting, um, interesting new stuff getting added right at the moment. But um, especially back in, um, uh, oh, sorry, I've jumped ahead a little bit. I, I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead a little bit. Um, the next 317, um, then there was a new system call added called SecComp. And this is the sort of more modern way of establishing a set comp filter. And it provides more options than the PRCTL system call. Um, and as I said, there's, there's more work ongoing. So there was a lot of features that were added in kernel 414. There's a whole lot of other features that are being worked on at the moment that are likely to land in the next kernel release, or well, not the next kernel release, but the next one or two releases after that, I would estimate. OK. <coughs> So, what's going on here? The fundamental idea is we can write filter programs that make decisions about system calls, and those, system, th those filter programs can make decisions based on the system call number and the system call arguments. And when I say arguments, I mean the register values. So, the filter program can say, I like this system call, the system call number, and I like the values in these registers, or I don't. What I'm trying to get across there is the filter program can look at the registers that contain the arguments. Some of those arguments might be pointers. The filter program can't dereference the pointers. Obviously, that would be an interesting thing to do, especially if the pointer pointed to, let's say, a path name. But the filter programs can't do that sort of thing at the moment. There is someone who's working on adding that sort of functionality. There's a new LSM that um, someone I know has been working on for two or three years called Landlock, which is intended, among other things, to bring that sort of functionality to SecComp. But it doesn't exist at this time. So, in order to use SecComp, we, in our user space program, we go through a few steps. The user space program builds a filter program, a kind of binary blob which is interpreted by a virtual machine. It, installs that filter program into the kernel. The kernel has this virtual machine implementation. And then the program executes untrusted code. In other words, some, some arbitrary third party code that we don't necessarily trust, or perhaps some code that we feel could be compromised. 
And of course, the way that code's going to be executed, either we exec a new program, or perhaps we've dynamically loaded a shared library, in other words, a plugin, and we're going to execute functions from that plugin. And now, from this point onwards, from the point where this, um, the um, filter is installed, every system call gets checked to see is it a permitted system call or not. Okay. Once you've installed that filter for the process, or once the process has installed that filter for itself, the filter can't be removed. This makes sense. A filter is a kind of declaration. We're about to execute some code that we don't necessarily trust. We don't want that code to be able to remove the filter. So once a filter is established for a process, it's permanent. Okay. So these set comp programs are um, expressed using um, the, the BPF, um, uh, BPF language, Berkeley Packet Filter. Now, it's, it's quite possible that many of you have heard of BPF already, of course, because it's used with TCP dump. And TCP dump has been around for, I don't know, 25, more than 25 years now. And the way that BPF is used with TCP dump TCP dump, of course, it's monitoring network traffic. And a notable characteristic of network traffic is there's a lot of it. And mostly you're only interested in a small piece of the conversation that's going on between two endpoints. You don't want to see everything else that is getting sent across the, the network link. So what you want TCP dump to do for you is to filter the information. So you only see selected network packets. And that's, that's, that's what TCP dump does. Now that filtering, could happen, theoretically, in user space. In other words, the TCP dump could put the network device into promiscuous mode, get every packet into user space, inspect the packet. That's possible. The problem with doing that approach is the sheer volume of data that needs to be transferred across the kernel user space boundary would put a big load on the system. So just transferring that data is expensive because there's so much of it. So the idea with... Um, BPF and TCP dump is the, with TCP dump, you can install a BPF program in the kernel, and that BPF program does a check on the network packet header and decides is this an interesting packet or not. And if it's interesting, then the packet gets transferred across the kernel user space boundary. And, and the brilliance of SecComp was to realize this virtual machine that is being used for inspecting network packet headers, which of course are just a bunch of bytes, this could be generalized to inspecting system call numbers and their arguments, which are just a bunch of bytes. And so that's why, um, uh, the, 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 when that idea of set comp was proposed, to go from the point where it was initially proposed to the point where it was actually merged into the kernel only took about a year, which is pretty good for a, uh, uh, a major kernel change. Okay, but part of the thing that assisted there was reusing this initial, this existing technology. Okay, <clears throat> so BPF defines a virtual machine. It's a virtual machine that's interpreted by the kernel. This virtual machine has a few characteristics. It's got a very simple instruction set, small set of instructions. All the instructions are the same size. This means the kernel can implement the virtual machine. Um, uh, easily and in a way that is efficient, fast. The kernel can also do things like verifying that programs are valid and safe. Okay, um, so one of the things about um, BPF programs, there are jump instructions, but you can only jump forward in a program. So programs are directed acyclic graphs. That means the kernel knows that every BPF program will complete. Because, of course, if you could have a BPF program inside the kernel that was executing that could loop, then you could conduct a, a denial of service attack against the kernel. Well, that's not possible because you can only go forward in a program. Um, the, simple, the instruction set is very simple. This means the kernel can verify that the opcodes are valid and that the arguments are valid. The kernel can even do things like detecting dead code, where there's some piece of code in the BPF program where there's a jump over the code, but no jump into the code, so that code could never be executed. If you try and load a BPF filter program into the kernel like that, the kernel rejects it because it's got dead code. Um, the kernel can also verify that every BPF program completes with a return instruction. The return instruction is basically uh, an information from the BPF program to the kernel saying, 
do we like this system call or not? BPF programs are limited in size. They can be up to 4K of instructions, which seems to be enough for most people's needs. So let's look at this virtual machine a bit more closely. It's, um, it's got an accumulator register. It's a 32-bit register. There's a data area. This is the information the program can operate on. This data area is information about the system call. For example, the system call number and the register values, the argument values. The instructions are 64 bits in size and expressed as a C structure, and this C structure is defined in the, um, in the, uh, in the in header files. Um, the 64-bit instruction looks like this. It begins with a 16-bit opcode. At the end, there's a 32-bit operand that the opcode uses, and for some instructions, there are two other byte fields that are used, and these are used for um, conditional jump instructions where these are instruction offset saying how far should we jump. And conditional jump instructions, BPF is a little bit unusual. There's two targets for every jump. There's a jump false target and a jump true target. So you can jump in either of two directions or either of two distances, I should say, depending on whether the, um, the conditional test is true or false. Um, it's a, it's a kind of pseudo-assembler-like language. It's a virtual machine, um, so it's a, it's a sort of a basic kind of assembler-type language. We've got load instructions. Uh, we've got store instructions. One of the things you can do with BPF programs, as well as the data area that you can operate on, there's some working memory that you can use to store information that you've calculated and you want to save temporarily. Um, there's jump instructions. There's the usual kinds of arithmetic and logic instructions, you know, add, multiply, left, shift, and, XOR, and so on. And there's these return instructions which say to the kernel, um, do we like this system call or not? Should the system call be allowed to be executed? Okay, so we've got these conditional jump instructions. We've got conditional and unconditional jump instructions. The conditional ju jump instructions consist of the usual pieces, an opcode saying what kind of condition are we testing, a value that we're going to test against in the operand, and then a jump false offset and a jump true offset. And in terms of the conditional jump instructions, we've got the sort of usual things you might expect, an equality test, um, a greater than test, a greater than or equal test, a bit set test, that's what the J set is. And if you look at that list, and that's the complete list, by the way, uh, you might say, well, there seem to be some things that are missing there. Where's the jump not equal or the jump um, less than or equal and so on? Well, those other alternatives are just the false branches of the existing instructions. So the false branch from jump equal is jump not equal. Okay, and the targets for these jumps are expressed as relative offsets, a certain number of instructions to jump. Zero means don't do a jump at all. In other words, execute the very next instruction. Otherwise, you can jump up to 255 instructions forward. Now, if you want to jump further than that, there's another unconditional jump instruction, jump always. And there, the offset is expressed in the operand, which is 16 bits, which is way more than you need to cover the 4K of available instructions in the, that are possible in a BPF program. Okay, so what the kernel does for this BPF program, for every system call, the BPF program gets, te gets executed, test is the system call an allowed system call or not, and the kernel provides a read-only buffer of data that describes the system call. Um, we can ex there's a header file here that shows us what that, um, that, that data area looks like. This is the data that's being provided by the kernel to the BPF program. And we've got a, 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 um, a various piece of information here. For example, the first thing, we've got the system call number. Which system call are we executing? Now, down the end there, we've got a number of arguments. 
On Linux, the maximum number of arguments that a system call can have is six. So there's space in that data area to allow for up to six arguments. Now, obviously, the number of arguments that's actually used depends on the system call. Some system calls use no arguments. But of course, you know that when you write your filter program, and you write your fil filter program to access the right number of arguments. Now, there's a couple of other fields in there as well. Um, an architecture field. This tells us what architecture are we currently executing on? Is it ARM, is it x86, is it MIPS or whatever? I'll come back to saying why that's important soon. Um, and then one other field in there, the instruction pointer. Now this is telling us from where in the process's virtual address space was this system call made? Okay, so this is the real virtual address in, your, in the actual process itself that where the system call was made. And when I first came across that, I thought, what's the use case? Why, why would you want to use that information? And I invented fantastical use cases like you could devise a filter program where if the, filter, if the system call was made from a, a certain shared library in a certain range of the address space, then we want to stop the system call being made. When I finally got to talk to the set comp developers about why it exists, why that field exists, the answer was, eh, because we could. <coughs> okay. Now, you could, you know, if you're feeling very 1950-ish or 1940-ish, code up your BPF programs in binary by hand. There are certain productivity tools that make the job easier. At the very least, there are some macros to find in header files that make your life easier if you're going to do this by hand. There are some other better productivity tools that I'll mention briefly later on as well. So there's some macros then, for example, in the header files that are used to construct BPF statements and BPF jump statements. Now, all these macros are doing is taking values together taking values and using them to build an initializer for that 64-bit structure that contains an opcode, a jump true, a jump false, and an argument. So BPF statement just takes an opcode and an argument, the, the argument, I don't know, for some reason it's called K, some history there, I don't know the details, and it takes those two values, builds the 64-bit initializer, the true and the false are zero because this isn't a jump instruction, and there's another um, macro BPF jump where you give it an opcode, an operand, and a jump true and a jump false argument, and again, it constructs a 64-bit initializer. So here's an example. What this instruction does, it's a load instruction, that's what the BPF LD tells us. Now, the first argument there is constructed by oring together various bit fields. Okay, these bit fields, these, these, these values here are just um, bit masks that are defined in header files. Um, what this, these, the, the first argument here is being defined using um, three bit fields ORed together. It's a load instruction. Then the, LD, the BPFW says, what is the size that we're loading? It's a word, in other words, 32 bits. And then the last part, BPF abs, says where, is, where are we doing the load from? And the, the abs here means load from the data area. In other words, the area that describes the system call. So we're loading a four byte word into the accumulator in preparation for doing something. Now, then the question is, well, which word are we loading? Well, we're loading the word at offset of struct set comp data arch. Now, who's come across the offset of macro before? Usually, I find relatively few people have done, have seen this. What this, it's a, it's a, it's a handy little macro. You give it a structure, the name of a structure and the name of a field inside that structure, and it gives you back the byte offset of that field. So going back to that structure definition there, we said, sorry, um, Set comp, uh, struct set comp data comma arch, give me the off, off, offset of the arch field, what's it gonna tell me? What's the return value from offset of? It's gonna be four, yeah? Four byte integer. Yeah, so what we're saying there is load the architecture field into the accumulator. Alrighty. Another example, this is a, uh, a conditional jump instruction. We're saying 
do a, um, a, a jump, the kind of jump we're doing, it's an equality test, it's a conditional jump, it's an equality test. Is the value in the accumulator equal to something? And then the question is, what something? Well, the BPFK says, the something that's in the operand of this instruction. And what's in the operand of this instruction? It's the value audit arch x8664. Now this is um, just a, a magic value in one of the kernel header files that corresponds to the, the architecture x8664. Every architecture has a unique um, value for the, um, uh, for the architecture type as seen by um, things like the audit subsystem and setcomp. Now, if the value in the accumulator is equal to this particular value here, then we're gonna jump forward one instruction. In other words, skip the very next instruction in the BPF program. Otherwise, we're gonna jump forward zero instructions. In other words, execute the very next instruction. Okay, another example, a, um, a return statement. This is information that the SEPCOMP program is giving back to the kernel. It's saying we're, we're terminating, terminating execution of the BPF program now, and we're gonna tell the kernel what do we think about this system call. So BPF return, terminate execution of the program, passing back the value in the operand. That's what the BPFK says. And the value in the operand says, ret kill process. We don't like this system call. We don't like it so much that the kernel should kill the process. Okay. So, I mentioned this architecture field that uh, appears in the data area, and I just wanna say a little bit more about that. And the, the point is that every BPF program, we'll look at a complete program soon, every BPF program should check the architecture of the, the, on which it's running. Now, there's a few different reasons for this. The, the first thing to realize is system call numbers are different on different architectures. The system call numbers on ARM are different from the system call numbers on x86. Uh, on x86 even, the system call numbers on x8632 are different from the system call numbers on x8664 and so on. So, we are building a BPF program that checks system call numbers, and those system call numbers depend on the architecture. So we better make sure we're executing on the architecture we really thought we were executing on. Because if we're not, then we're making the wrong assumptions about system call numbers. Now, why, th why could things go wrong like this? You know, perhaps we, just, we constructed a BPF blob on one system, and then using some sort of configuration ma management system, we installed that BPF blob, blob on another system, and a program loaded it and installed that BPF filter for itself, but it happened by accident that the blob was built on one architecture but got loaded on another architecture. That could be a possibility. There are other possibilities though. We've got things like modern x86, modern x86 architectures that actually support multiple system call ABIs. So on x86, um, 64, we've got the, uh, sorry, on x86, we've got, on modern x86, we've got the x86-64 ABI, we've got the old i386 API, and we've also got the um, x32 ABI, which is a, um, has 32-bit integers and, um, and, and uh, sorry, 32-bit longs and pointers, but a, a, a 64 gigabyte, uh, uh, sorry, um, a 64-bit address space. And each one of those three architectures has, in some cases at least, different numbers for the different system calls. So, I said when you install a setcomp filter, it stays permanently installed for the process. But the thing is, a process could exec different programs during its lifetime. And it might start off executing a 64-bit x86 program, but then that program executes an i386 binary. Now that binary is going to use different system call numbers, and those system call numbers won't necessarily be valid when tested in the, by the same sec comp BPF filter program. So it's, it's imperative that the filter program always has to begin by checking the, the architecture on which it's running. Okay, now, once a filter is installed, 
every system call that the process then makes gets tested against the filter. The filter returns a value saying, do we like this system call or not? And this is done with one of these BPF RAT instructions, and the return value that the filter gives back to the kernel consists of 32 bits. The first 16 bits, the topmost 16 bits, are some kind of action saying, you know, what do we generally think about this system call? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, there's various choices you can make. And the bottom 16 bits are some kind of data that goes with the action. Okay, so this is the information that the BPF filter program is returning to the kernel to say, you know, do something in response to our decision about this system call. And what sort of return values can we give, or can the BPF program give back to the kernel? BPF ret allow. Yeah, the system call's fine. Let the system call proceed and the process continue. Or BPF ret kill process. We don't like this system call. We, we don't like it so much, you should kill the process straight away. And all the threads in the process get killed they get killed as though, or the, the process gets killed as though it was killed with a SIG sys signal. Now I say as though because there is actually no signal involved. Okay? The process is killed outright. But to another process, for instance, a parent process or a ptrace process that was observing this process, it would look like the process was killed with a SIG sys signal. And the reason that SIG sys signal or that, that decision was made is SIG sys is one of the, or is the traditional signal, meaning a process tried to execute an invalid system call. Okay, another possibility. The filter program could return to the kernel saying, sec comp ret kill thread. We don't like the system call, kill the thread that made it. But if it's a multi-threaded process, then the, the rest of the threads continue. Kind of odd, I find, but it's possible. Okay, another possibility is we say sec comp ret erno. Now, what this says to the kernel is don't execute the system call, make it look like the system call has failed. And in the erno value that's returned to the user space program, there'll be whatever value we specified in the bottom 16 bits of the uh, return value. In other words, the set comp ret data field. Going back there, remember the, the, um, the return value is two pieces, 16-bit action and 16 bits of data. Well, the data says what, what earner value should be returned to the user space program. So from the point of view of the user space program, it looks like the system call failed, but the program can carry on doing whatever it wants to do in response to the failure. There are a few other actions as well, but I'm not going to try and talk about them. I'll just mention they exist. You can read about them in the manual page. Okay, so, um, in order to use or to install a BPF program, a process uses either the PRCTL system call or the SecComp system call to say that we want to install a BPF filter and We've got a, a series of arguments there. So for instance, for SecComp, this last argument here is a pointer to the BPF program that we want to install. Um, I'll ignore the flags. You can read about them in the manual page. But this pointer there to the filter program looks like this. It's a pointer to a structure of type SOCF prog. And this tells us about the networking origins of BPF, a socket filter program. OK, and what's in that structure? There's a pointer to a filter program, a SOC filter, again, networking origins, that is our actual BPF program, and up here, the LEN, uh, the LEN field is the size of that program. Okay, now, this is slightly um, uh, complicated to explain, but I hope I get it across. If you're going to use SecComp, the process either has to be privileged or it has to set something called the no new privs bit. Now, what is this bit about? So this means if, you, if the process is unprivileged, it has to set this bit. Now, this is a, this is a process attribute, uh, again set with the good old multiplexing PRCTL system call. And what does this bit mean? It means that if this process now executes a set UID or a set GID, or a, a program, or a program with capabilities, those 
the set UID bit, the set GID bit, the file capabilities are ignored. Now, why is that? Let's suppose you're an attacker. And you're an attacker, I've turned them off deliberately. <laughs> um, you're an attacker who knows about setcomp, and you know that people who write set UID programs aren't always tidy in what they do. They sometimes make mistakes. You know, perhaps they don't check the return value from some system call that maybe could fail. And you think, hey, this, 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 this developer of this set UID root program, they didn't check the return value on that system call because they assumed the system call would always succeed. But I can use setcomp to make that system call fail. In other words, I can use setcomp, this is what I hope, I could use setcomp to make the set UID root program do something unexpected. That's the theory, okay? Attackers love that sort of thing. Making a privilege pro pro program do something unexpected is the first step in privilege escalation. Now, that's actually not possible though, because if you're an unprivileged user, if you want to use setcomp, you have to set this no new privs bit first. And that says that set UID bits and set GID bits and file capabilities now no longer have an effect. So it's to avoid that kind of theoretical attack that I mentioned. It's not possible because of this. Okay, if you try and install a setcomp filter and you're not privileged and you haven't set that bit, then the kernel says, no, sorry. Alrighty, let's look at a real example. Um, so, we've got a, a, a program here. What it's going to do, it's going to, ins uh, first of all, it sets the no new privs bit using PRCTL. Then it's got some code that installs a filter. And then we're going to execute some system call, open. Okay, and there's a little clue there with the next line, we won't get this far in the code. And that's because the setcomp filter is going to kill the process when it tries to make the open system call. So let's look at this BPF filter. What have we got for instructions? Okay, there's my install filter function. The very first thing it does is define a, a, an array of struct soc filter um, structures and what are the, the, we've got various instructions in each one of these um, array elements. The first instruction here says load a word uh, into the accumulator from the data area and then the word that we're loading is the word at offset of architecture. In other words, load the architecture into the accumulator. Then do a conditional jump. Is the information in the accumulator equal to the value in the operand? And the operand value is arch x864. In other words, we're asking, is the architecture we're executing on x864? If it is, we're gonna jump forward one instruction. In other words, we're gonna skip over the next instruction. If it's not equal, then we're gonna jump forward zero instructions to this return statement that says, kill the process. We're not on the architecture we expected. The system call numbers are not going to be what we expect. So let's get out of here, terminate the process. But otherwise, what we do is go further forward, we load into the accumulator a word from the data area. The word we're loading is the word at the offset of the system call number. In other words, load the system call number into the accumulator. And then we do an equality test. Is the word in the accumulator, jump equality, testing against the value in the operand, is it equal to the NR open value? Now, NR open is just a value that's defined in one of the header files. It's the number of the open system call on this architecture. So if this is an open system call, jump forward two instructions. Zero, one, two, land down here, and that is return to the control of the kernel, telling the kernel, kill the process. And then if it's not equal to open, then we jump forward zero instructions, and we test, we load into the accumulator, the, uh, sorry, we do an equality test. Is the word in the accumulator equal to the open at system call number? Now, open at is a variation on open. So we're checking for both kinds of system calls that do an open. There are actually a few other system calls that open files as well, but this is my simple example. So if it is equal to the open at system call, jump forward one instruction, or it's zero, one, kill the process. 
Otherwise, jump forward zero instructions, and we land here. Every other system call is allowed. Okay, here's the rest of my install filter program. There's my struct fprog structure. The filter field of the structure points to my actual filter program. The size of that filter program I put here into len, it's the, si it's the um, size of the filter array divided by the size of the first element. In other words, the number of instructions in the filter. Okay, so when I run the program, then what's gonna happen is I see this being printed out by the shell, bad system call. What I don't see is that message from the program that said, you know, you won't see this, that printf string saying you won't see this string. And that's because the program or the process tried to call open, the BPF filter denied that, the kernel killed the process, and it made it look like the process terminated with a sig sys signal. The shell saw that the process that it started looked like it was killed by a sig sys signal and printed out the standard text corresponding to the sig sys signal, bad system call. Okay. I knew I wasn't gonna have enough time. I think I'm supposed to finish now, is that true? I think it is. Okay, I'm gonna race through, I'm not gonna try and do another example. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, I'll just quickly say, um, PRCTL and setcomp, one of the filters that you install, they might allow PRCTL and setcomp system calls. If that's the case, then you can add more filters to the process. So a process might have multiple filters in effect. All those filters get executed. That's possible. Um, there are some other details there that I'm not gonna try and get through. Um, if, you, if your filters allow you to do fork or clone to create child processes, the child inherits the filters. In other words, fork and clone can't be used to escape filtering. Same thing, if the filters allow exec VE to ex so that you can exec a new program, the filters stay in place. So executing a new program isn't a way of escaping a filter either. Um, now once you do this, when you install a BPF filter, this gets executed for every system call. There is a performance cost, um, but in these days of Spectre and Meltdown, it matters less and less. Um, okay, so for example, on that example that I just showed you, uh, where I had six BPF instructions in my filter, if I took that filter and instead applied it to a program that just calls the get PPID system call, which turns the parent process ID, that's of course uh, a very cheap system call. If I ran that on an old system, it increased the execution of the process about 25%. Now, two things I wanna say about that. 25% if the JIT compiler wasn't enabled. There is a JIT compiler for BPF, which makes BPF go quite a lot faster. And that was 25% on a kernel that didn't have the Spectre and Meltdown mitigations installed, because nowadays get PPID takes 300% more time to execute than it used to. So, ah, we can reduce that 25% to 6%. <laughs> and then the JIT compiler reduces it to 2%. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, just a little word of warning. BPF seems like a great thing to some people, and it is a useful thing, but one of the things you're gonna do when you install it, when you um, create BPF filters for a process or for a program, is you're gonna ask yourself, well, which system calls does my program actually make? And that's not an easy question to answer. And there are various ways you might, you might try S tracing your proce process. You can go and talk to Dimitri here about that. Uh, Dimitri's gonna talk, talk, talk about S trace later on. Um, the thing is, there's no perfect way of answering this question. You hope that you've got it right, because if you've got it wrong, and your filter denied a legitimate system call, then your filter's gonna cause your application to crash, okay? So you can use setcomp to inject bugs into an application. Um, and it's made even more complicated because in a program we normally call wrapper functions, not system, we don't use system call numbers directly, and those wrapper functions, their behavior in the C library changes over time. What I'm trying to say here is you can't just create a set comp filter and forget about it. It's gotta be part of your continuous integration testing. It's gotta be unit tested like every other piece of code. Okay, so it's gotta be part of your general testing of your application. 
Um, there's an article here that talks about that on lwn.net, um, the inherent fragility of seccomp. Okay, I just want to very briefly mention there are some other tools then for um, improving your productivity with seccomp because that idea of hand coding those instruction, instructions gets old really fast. There is a library around called libseccomp. It's a set of APIs where you can say, I want a a filter that does this. Give me a rule that filters for the open system call or perhaps the uh, fork system call or a rule that filters for the clone system call. And then you can say, I want a various set of rules. And then you can say, OK, now construct that filter for me and install it for the process. So what this filter here is doing, we're saying uh, this context object here is the sort of general handle on which everything hangs. And we're saying initialize the object, add a rule saying that clone should fail with eperm, uh, fork should fail with e not sup load the filter into the kernel, and then execute some code, which is going to be filtered. So then when we try and call fork here, fork is going to fail. Okay, so this is much more comfortable uh, than coding up those instructions yourself by hand. Um, yeah, and I think I really must be over time now, so I won't say much more than that. And maybe if there's one or two questions, otherwise I'll and let the next speaker get on here. Yes? Once a filter is installed, it cannot be removed. A filter that is installed cannot be removed. Can it be changed? And it cannot be changed. Okay, you can add more filters, but oh. that, only thing, that only makes things more restrictive. On, uh, a, a, new filter, yeah, a new filter can't change the behavior of, of an existing filter. And if you have multiple filters, you can execute a syscall only if all of the filters oh. allowed. Yeah, so if there's multiple filters, all of them must permit the system call. Okay. Question? You have to yell at me, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, I can't hear you from up here. It's actually a very big room. Maybe we can talk about it offline, because I think the next speaker needs to get set up. Is it you, Dimitri? It doesn't draw. Oh, so. Well, Jeff, that's good. I'm myself. Okay. So, do you know of any portable ways uh, to, mm. to write it, that kind of filters uh, portable across architectures? Yeah. Well, well, you have a, like, uh, yeah, so. of start family six calls, yeah. uh, and you write all of those of devs. Yeah. Is there a. Static is added, and. Yeah. yeah. Is there a portable way of writing set comp filters? Lib set comp is the best we've got at the moment. It does a lot of the architecture-specific stuff for you, but it's not quite perfect, but it's the best we've got. There, there is an idea that one day, SecComp will be able to use eBPF, and for eBF, eBPF, there is a Clang front end that enables you to generate eBPF code, but so far, SecComp can't use eBPF. It only uses classic BPF. But it's not going to be future-proof against aging calls. No, it's not. This is the inherent, it's the inherent fragility of set comp. <laughs> yeah, it's those filters have got to be tested like every other piece of code, in a future proof way. Yeah. Okay. Where is the next speaker? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Look. Please don't. Leave, you know. <laughs> no problem.
there's any questions. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. If there's any questions, it there are two microphones. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay, Aitha, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, welcome. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, this is a talk on how to write modern video camera driver for Linux. And I would like to use an example as a well-known framework which is going through a removal or deprecation process to show how the system we work on has changed since the time that framework has been implemented. And hopefully I would like to give some suggestions and examples if you have drivers depending on said framework on how to make them, on how to remove those dependencies and have your driver working for next kernel re releases. So these are a few of my contacts. My name is Jacopo. This is my email address. Uh, this is my IRC contact. I'm an embedded Linux and free software developer and I work as a consultant and I've been lucky enough to work with the uh, excellent Renaissance uh, mainline kernel team in the last two years, which gave me the opportunity to contribute to Linux in a kind of a regular way. Uh, I would like to thank Renaissance, of course, for sponsoring me and supporting in giving this talk and this day uh, the activities. And that's the talk outline. So we're going to look at what's happening at SOC Camera, which is the framework that I've been talking about, and what has changed since the day that SOC Camera has been implemented. Uh, the main difference is that how system boots, because we have moved from a world where system boots are using board files to, so to, through, to firmware uh, supported boot process. And that changes the way we discover and probe and create devices. Power management has changed as well. That depends on how the image capture devices are show up in user space. And finally, I would like to give a practical example of a driver that was developed for SSC camera and has been made a modern Linux, video for Linux driver in uh, recent kernel releases. I would like also to introduce a bit of glossary because words are sometimes confusing. And to capture images, we need, of course, an image sensor that produces those images, and the receiving port, which is usually installed on the SOC. A sensor driver controls an image sensor, and the bridge or receiver driver controls the receiving port on the SOC. On modern system, we, have, we still have an image sensor that produces images and an image receiver, but we also have several components on the SOC that takes care of image transformation and manipulation. Image sensor and drivers for those kind of components are generally called video sub-device driver. Let's start by discussing what's happening to SSC camera and start by saying that SSC camera was great in my opinion. And can I ask how many people here have ever worked with SSC cameras? Okay, just a few, but. So if you work with that framework, you know it, it was great because it provides you a nice abstraction away for the crude v V4L2 API, which might be kind of scary if that's the first video driver you have to write. It's kind of scary to deal with all the complexity of the video for Linux API, all the uh, IOCTLs you have to take, take care of, buffer allocation, and SSC camera abstracted all those things away in a nice way, and that's why it was made adopted in a lot of driver in mainline. And I don't have statistics for that, but my feeling is that in BSPs and in downstream kernels, it was kind of everywhere. All the BSPs kernel I've been working with, uh, if they have a camera driver, it was based on SSC camera. And it was so adopted because it has good points, like as I've said, it provided a nice abstraction away for V4L2. It's the same framework for writing bridges, and sensor drivers. So you learn one framework, you write two drivers, that was nice. And also it provides an easy way to link bridge driver to sensor drivers because the two of them had to be linked in order for the bridge driver to cause operation on the sensor one. 
Of course, there is a bad side, since we are removing that, there is a bad side, of course. And SOC Camera was developing a time where system booted through both files, and this support for uh, OF, or device tree, and nowadays ECPI, which is gaining traction in embedded systems as well, is limited. It is there, I know, but it's limited, and we're gonna see why. It uses a set of deprecated operation, which is a fixable thing, but while the V4L2 API evolved, the uh, SC camera framework using those API has not been evolved in the same way. So this is fixable, but it's not been done so far. And more than everything else, the media controller and subdev API that have been introduced like five, six years ago are actual game changers because they change the way that how image capture devices show up in user space. So they change, SOC camera haven't really kept up with that. And what's happening to SOC camera? SOC camera, it's deprecated for a long time, so you are suggested not to use that for write drivers, but it's gonna be removed, finally, because it's a long time we're gonna, we, that talks about that, possibly in the next kernel release. Uh, the last SOC camera bridge driver has been removed, has been ported to be a video for Linux driver last year, so there are no more platforms that depend on that framework. Although there are some sensor driver, in or the order of tens, ten of them pro probably, that have not been ported yet, and they're gonna be possibly removed. There are discussion these days if moving them to staging or, moving them, or removing them completely it's possible they're gonna be removed completely. And that's the file organization. We know that platform bridge drivers are usually in drivers media platform and SOC camera drivers are drivers media platform SOC camera. And here we have no more dependencies. While for uh, drivers media I2C where sensor drivers are, we have some of them which, have, which will be removed. Currently in mainline we have kind of a confusing situation because we have two drivers from the same device, which is kind of confusing, but from next release this is, this is going away. So if there are drivers here that needs to be ported here, and that's work to do if somebody would like to contribute to that, it's, it's a nice thing to do. What has changed then since the time when SSC camera was implemented? As we said, the device discovery and linking mechanism has changed. Nowadays, we do that using notifiers and async ma matching. Power, man power management has changed as well due to the way how video devices are exposed in user space. And we now have fra standard frameworks for clock and regulators. And so SOC camera doesn't use deprecated frameworks for that. So every time it's, it's possible, we should use the standard frameworks for dealing with th those two things. Let's start talking about device probing and have a look at the, how device probe was performed in the legacy way. So we have five components here, board files, bridge driver, SOC camera, sensor driver, and of course the video for Linux 2 framework. The board file is nothing but the plain C file that register devices and drivers one after the other, all devices in the system. And at a certain point, it will add the uh, platform driver for the bridge driver. So that causes the bridge driver to probe. At the end of the probe section uh, of the probe function, uh, the bridge driver will probably register itself to the SOC camera framework. That causes the SOC camera to do all the initialization operation. And at, cer at a certain point, it will start registering I2C devices. How does it do that? It does that using a V4L2 function, which is this one, V4L2 I2C new subdev board, which creates a new I2C device that causes the sensor driver to probe. And how are those two identified? Well, the board file knows the I2C bus number and the I2C address of the device and passes it down to the, in the call chain until here, where, which, uh, where those two information are used to identify the sensor driver. So in the old world, we have that devices are identified by I2C addresses, and more important than everything, the device probing is sequential. So we have the bridge driver probing before the sensor driver. And that guarantees that every time a sensor driver probes, it has a bridge driver to connect to. In the new world, we have, we have moved to a uh, firmware-based boot process. So 
nowadays devices are creating parsing a firmware description of the system, and the devices are not identified anymore by I2C addresses, by the firmware node references. And again, more important than everything, there is no guarantee anymore on the probing order of, this, of the drivers. So this is a DTS, and in the DTS we have a description of a video input port here and of an I2C bus. On the I2C bus there is a sensor identified by an address, and the system boots, Linux boots, and start parsing the DTS until it, it, it finds the video input port nodes. That causes the bridge driver to probe, and at a certain point it starts parsing the I2C bus, which creates the sensor driver, which probes again, and can safely connect to the bridge driver. But we can also have the other way around. So the I2C bus is registered before the VDA input port. This is probed first, and the Samsung driver probes, completes its probe operation, but find, finds no one there to register to. And that might be a problem. It's actually a problem, because now device probing is totally asynchronous. We have no guarantees, which is the probing order. And again, we need to identify devices by the firmware node references. How to do that? Well, V4L2 framework to the rescue here because it has two components that are designed for helping you, help drivers doing that exactly, which are V4L2 async and V4L2 FW node. How do they work and how drivers use them? Well, we have a bridge driver again, DTS, and the two framework components. And in DTS, we have a description on the input port, on the output ports of the bridge driver, which has two ports connected to two remote endpoints, which are possibly sensor or sub-devices driver. The, sense, the bridge driver probes and uses a VD4L2 FW node framework to parse the DTS and collect references to the remote endpoints. Those two are collected in the form of VDFRL2 async subdevice, which is an abstraction provided to you by this part of the framework. And those two devices are collected by the bridge driver. What does the bridge, the bridge driver do with that? The bridge driver stores them in what is called a notifier. It's actually a V4L2 async notifier which is provided, defined by this part of the framework. A notifier is nothing but a collection of um, firmware node references the bridge driver or a generic driver is waiting for. V4L2 Asyncs maintains a list of all notifier registers in the system. Now we have three, four in total, which is kind of likely in a system, but it's possible, totally possible. And the bridge driver does nothing but register its notifier with devices is waiting for to V4L2 async. V4L2 asyncs uh, maintains as well a list of waiting devices. These are devices or sub-devices that probed and no one is waiting for them. So they're put in the waiting list. At a certain point in time, we have that the sensor driver probes eventually, and it uses V4L2 FW node to parse its local endpoint and create a V4L2 async subdevice um, representation of itself. It will then register that to V4L2 asyncs, which adds them to the list of waiting devices, but the two of them gets matched, so there is someone waiting for this sensor. When the two of them get matched, that causes the V4L2 async to call a callback on the, on the bridge driver that bounds the sub-device to the driver. So in this way, the bridge will have and handle a reference to the sensor driver. The second, well, okay, we are waiting for two sensor drivers, and the second sensor eventually will probably in future does the same things usually V4L2 FW node create a V4L2 async subdevice representation of itself and register that to V4L2 async. That causes the same the device to be matched and the subdevice bound and the bound and the bound callback to be called on the bridge driver. And so in this way, the bridge has reference to both the sensor driver is waiting for. Uh, there is another thing I've not shown uh, I have not shown here, which is uh, there's no, not only the bound callback, there is this thing called complete callback that it's usually called when 
all the sub-device notifier, or all the, not the su asynchronous sub-device the notifier is waiting for have been registered, the complete callback is usually called here. The complete callback usually called, uh, creates all the um, user space representations, so video device node and video sub device node connected to the world capturing uh, infrastructure. There is a discussion going on nowadays if it's a good thing. If you have eight, let's say you're waiting for eight cameras and one of them is not probing, do you want your system to be working or not? So should complete be called only when all these sub devices have probed or sometimes it's a good thing to have a working system even if one of your sub devices or camera fails. There will be discussion about that in the uh, video for Linux 2 meeting on two days from now. And let's see what's happened there. Of course, that's what we show so far is the situation where the bridge driver probes first, but we wanted to solve a problem which is the asynchronous probing uh, problems. So the sensor may probe first. So the sensor probes uses V4L2FW node to register its async sub-device, and that gets added to the waiting list. Nobody's waiting for them because there are no notifiers waiting for this sub-device, but in a certain point in the future, the bridge driver probes and will register a notifier waiting for this device. The two of them gets matched, and the two of them gets connected. So we effectively solve the problem of async uh, probing sequences using those two framework. And the ones of you, of you that knows SOC camera knows that SOC camera can do that, actually does that. It uses those two framework. And so why, it, what has changed since then? What has changed since the time where SOC camera uh, has been implemented is that now sub devices can have notifiers as well. This has been introduced one year ago by Nicholas, Sakari, and Laurent, which are the main author of the uh, V4L2 Async and V4L2 FW node frameworks to support the Renaissance Archive CSI in infrastructure, which has sub-devices that are connected to sensors. So we moved from a situation where we have a receiver which has a notifier and connects to a sub-device to a situation where a sub-device can have a sub-notifier and eventually that sub, device, that sub notifier will be connected to, to other sub devices. This can create a chain of arbitrary complexity. It's usually just one of two level, but there's nothing preventing you from making more complicated things here. And right now I think a couple of driver main lines are usually that IMX, well, uh, our car for sure, but also IMX is now using sub device notifier and it's expected that more devices will use it uh, this abstraction as well. Power management. As we said, power management has changed as well due to the way that uh, video devices are now represented in user space, and that depends on the way, on the introduction of media controller and sub dev API. So media controller, the old device, the old world, non-media controller equipped devices, they work with a single device node abstraction. So the one that we were all are used to, the dev video zero abstraction. So for a wall capturing infrastructure, you just have a single device node in user space. And that causes all operation to be sequential. They go through a single device node and gets directed to the sub device. We now live in a world where media control is everywhere and it's going to be everywhere, hopefully in the next year. And video device node are not the only abstraction we have in user space because we have also video sub device node. And that causes all operation not to be sequential anymore, but instead they can be uh, performed on sub devices and video devices at the same time. So let's see an example of that. This is a legacy system where we have the simplest possible capture infrastructure. So we have a sensor that is connected to an I2C bus and it's connected to a receiver port where it transmits pixels. In kernel space, they will, be, um, uh, they will be managed by a receiver driver, a sensor driver, and that's the framework part which is common to the two, to the, the, the kernel frameworks. And the user space, we will have just a single device node abstraction. So all this infrastructure here is represented by a single device node. 
We have, of course, a video for L2 compliant application, and which interfaces with all that with the V4L2 APIs. Usually, at the first thing we, operation we have to do if you want to use the video device, it's to call an open on this video device node. And usually, at set power, uh, at open time, the bridge driver just powers up the sensor. So in that way, every other operation, the sensor driver is ready to, uh, to send pixel to the receiver. So the V4L2 compliant applications start calling uh, different IOCTLs, set formats, get formats, allocate buffers, whatever, and a certain point, and all the operation will be translated by the receiver driver to the sensor driver using a V4L2 subdev call operation. At a certain point, we will receive a stream on, so the application won't actually the sensor to stream pixels. And this causes a lot of settings to be sent on the I2C bus, and pixels will start flowing in this direction. This is, what, this is what a modern device might look like, a very simplified, actually, modern device might look like. So we still have a sensor, we still have a receiver port, but we also have a lot of components on the SOC that takes care of image transformation and manipulation. That can be resizing, conversion between one format and another, uh, formatting system memory, depend, totally depends on your platform. And of course, the uh, drivers that handles that are much more uh, different from the legacy one, and they might have different components. They, you may have one ISP driver handling all three of them, uh, one receiver driver, that depends on your platform. But the important thing is that this is how it, it would look like in user space. So we still have the video device node zero, which the application uses to start streaming and call a certain set of operation, but we also have all these device nodes here, which are sub-device nodes, where the application can call sub-dev operation as well. So this is what may happen. We may have video sub-devices IOCTLs call on video sub-device node at any, any time. And there is no relationship between one and the other, so we might have those two call at different times. And that causes all of your operation to be now asynchronous because there is not a shared notation of power settings anymore along all this pipeline. So the only thing, the only suggestion that I have for if you are to implement a driver in this kind of situation is always cache your settings every time because you never know the power state your driver is working in. You might receive a set format and your sensor might not be powered at all because we don't have the single entry point we had when working with no media controller systems. That calls for maintaining a driver-wise power state notation. Every time you should know if your device is powered or not, and even better, if you want to make that ref counted, it's even better, because if you receive two set power, that should not happen, but who knows what user space is doing. You should receive two uh, power off, to, to actually power off the device. Also, you should cache all your settings and apply them at a the time where it is known the sensor or the sub-devices to be powered, and it, that's usually stream on time, because when you receive a stream on, you, start, you should start sending pixel, and at that time, the sensor should be powered on. Also, this is a general suggestion for not just for video devices, but try to use runtime PM. Runtime PM makes, provides you an abstraction that it's more similar to the sequential flow of operation that we've seen before. So, it easy development and ref counting of power states. Of course, it's not always possible, but it's welcome. Clocks, GPOs, and regulators. As said, we have frameworks for that right now, and they should be used whenever possible. And relating to power management routine, in the legacy world, we have the, the board file that provided power management routine to the sensor. So this is how SOC camera used to do that. There is an SOC camera link with a, uh, a power callback and the board file 
just fill that pointer with a, a routine defined in the board file. So when the driver needed to power up and power off the sensor, it called these things here, and the board file has all the references to regulators, resets, whatever it needs to power on and off the sensor. Of course, we don't have board files anymore. We have DTS or ACPI. And how would you do that? Well, you should use the GPIO clock and regulator frameworks. Every time they interface with the DTS, you collect references from firmware, which is usually called DevM or not DevM, depending if you want to use a, a DevM clock or regulators get and use the name using DTS. And the driver itself should not rely anymore on the board files, turning on and off the, the, the singular components, but it's the driver itself that should enable or disable uh, the, the, comp the, the regulators or the reset line at s as power time. Practical, so this is an example of a video driver that was, as, was developed using SOC camera, and in recent, uh, I think, two releases ago, has been ported to be a plain video for Linux 2 drivers. So I would like to go through all the patch, not all of them, but some patches that, and show you how, what are the steps that has been uh, performed to do that in order, and if you have any driver depending on SSC camera and you want to port them and possibly submit them for inclusion, that's a kind of, of a guidelines for doing that. So the first thing we did was just copy the sensor driver as it was from SSC camera to the Vida for Linux 2 sensor driver directory. That was a choice that allowed us to see the differences without having any modification in the first commit. Then the first commit actually removed all the dependencies from SSC camera from the driver, and that's exactly what we, what we have been talking about. So, uh, handling cloak and GPIOs in the drivers and not relying on the board file for doing that. Register the async subdevice because SOC camera was doing that for you and now you should do that explicitly in your driver. Remove SOC camera specific uh, deprecated operation. In video for Linux, two, these operations are, uh, well, are deprecated. SOC camera still depends on that and still wants them. So they had to be removed and re-implemented in the proper set format and get format operation. And then there are a few changes which are specific to, G to this driver, which are specific to this driver, so I'm just here for reference. Of course, the build system has to be adjusted, but that's trivial. And then, after uh, a plain video for Linux 2 driver has been made out of the SOC camera depending one, uh, the fun begin because people actually start using that and that's exciting because patches are start coming so people actually start using that and specifically patches have been adding components, parts of to that driver that made the modern video for Linux driver out of what it was an old one. So the first thing we saw was adding media controller support to this driver. That means that the driver now has a sub-device as a subdevice in you, as a subdevice in user space, so you now need to s handle nested set power calls. That's exactly the thing that cache your setting at keep a, a, a power not power state notation in your driver. Also, you should not access registers when the sensor is powered down. Now you can receive a get uh, a control a get control from user space while your sensor is powered down, and you should pay attention not accessing the accuracy bus while uh, the sensor is powered off. Uh, there was support for frame interval handling. This is a kind of a request right now if you want to submit a uh, video for Linux driver. Frame handling is something that is kind of mandatory, doing that at least for a few frame rates. Um, that's another thing that calls for a shared state notation. So if your driver is streaming, uh, you, should refuse, you should return EBZ or another error flags if you want to set format or change the, inter, the frame interval. And the last change is the creation of the subdevice node that goes along with the support for the media controller operations. 
So I've been probably too fast. So we have 10 minutes for question. I hope you have some at least, because otherwise I've been really too fast. I had 100 slides, so I was worried that it was, that time was not enough, but actually I've been probably talking too fast. So if you have any question or anything you want to talk about, or any question about, any discussion about how things could evolve, in not just for SOC camera based driver, but sensor driver in general, there are two microphones here, so please go ahead. Uh, so I'm just wondering, um, when you're writing this new code, you're adapting it, what sort of techniques you use for debugging and working out what's going wrong? Because it sort of strikes me this is a more complex setup of everything being asynchronous, and when it's not working, you might not have much idea as to which bit isn't actually hooking up. So you get hungry, that's the first thing. No. No, well, I, I mean, you, you get disappointed when things doesn't well, work. That, that's say, the, yeah. the first debugging tool you use usually. <laughs> And, well, that depends totally on the system that you use, but things are now asynchronous, so having a notion, again, of what is the power state, that's always useful. And talking about streaming, start and stop, that's and now handled through the media controller frameworks. So you have a pipeline notation. The pipeline, it's, where's that? Uh, that's, it's basically a pipeline. All the components here are uh, put in a pipeline. And when you start streaming, the media controller frameworks goes one on the other and calls start, start stream on all of them. So having the bugging, adding the enabling the bugging, the media controller frameworks help you understanding what's going on at each step of the capture process. But in the end, you should just know what's happening in your sensor driver. If you have problem streaming, it depends on what problem you have. You don't receive images, you receive bad images, uh, you are missing a set format call, that depends on the driver usually, and, all your, and what debugging tools your system provide, because compared to other parts of the system, it's hard to debug those kind of things using JTAG. Because, well, there is an ice crispy bus in the middle, so you should, the, the last resort is printing out all the messages you're sending on the ice crispy bus, printing all of them, see what happened, go and go with the data sheet, and do the comparison. So there are different degrees of complexity you, you may want to handle. So I don't know if you have a specific use case for that or. Uh, well, um, maybe it's not so you give that. Uh, we have time, so. About five minutes afterwards, <laughs> so that's okay. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you. More time for, for coffee.